Lacking the incentive of job-related upward mobility, wage-earning women fought to satisfy immediate and pressing needs. Bread and butter issues like wages, hours, sanitary conditions, and safety regulations assumed critical importance. Women did not take these conditions lying down. Repeated protests erupted during the Civil War. A group of Cincinnati sewing women sent a petition to President Abraham Lincoln asking for protection against the contracting system. They suggested simply abolishing it. Lincoln, of course, did nothing. That same year, another group of women published an advertisement in the New York Sun in which they argued that the grinding evils of small pay and unjust treatment from employers could be remedied only by, and I'm quoting here, holding them up to the public gaze and reflecting the names and places of businesses of those who are living on the tears and pain and toil of the daughters of free America. The advertisement revealed the names of some of their bosses, again to no avail. Working women joined with middle-class women to create the Working Women's Union, which developed branches in several states and sought to consolidate the efforts of wage-earning women. The Working Women's Union urged women to create cooperative workshops that would provide sickness and death benefits and share any profits. That union expected that in this way, cooperators could earn substantially more than they were then getting paid. Within a year, about a hundred of these cooperatives emerged. Sadly, most failed to get the amount of work they expected and quickly collapsed. Even the strongest of them, a sewing cooperative in Detroit, lasted less than two years. Boston organized one that became so militant that it was driven out of business by contractors who agreed not to deal with them. The protests of sewing women did not cease when the Civil War ended. Women had hoped that the sewing machine introduced in 1850 would increase their wages because it replaced slow hand stitching. But the machine attracted so many men into the field that Boston seamstresses asked that men be excluded from the industry. Failing that, they urged state legislators to provide them with homes so they could find some comfort. They wanted to be able to leave those homes, they said, to their daughters, but not their sons. Such protests took second place to women's efforts to create and join trade unions. My favorite of these is the woman collar workers of Troy, New York. Women collar workers not only manufactured collars, but laundered them as well. Remember in those days, shirts came with detachable collars. A man seeking respectability but lacking income could wear the same shirt day after day and simply changed the collar so his outfit looked fresh. Women collar workers who made, laundered, and ironed the collars for sale formed the Union of Women's Collar Workers in 1868. It was led by Kate Mullaney, one of the heroic figures of the early women's labor movement, who joined with a parallel male union. The two groups, unusually, supported each other for several years until the men pulled back and the women's collar union collapsed. Men's interests in unions differed from women's and often set males and females at odds. True, men wanted higher wages and better working conditions, but in the 19th century, they were more often concerned with resisting new hierarchical and managerial structures in the workplace. Skilled men wanted the right to control their own jobs. Women typographers, skilled printers, fell afoul of their male colleagues for just this reason. When men would not admit them to their union, 
they organized themselves into the Women's Typographical Union No. 1 under the leadership of Augusta Lewis and with help from Susan B. Anthony, who asked the women to print her newspaper, The Revolution. The Women's Union functioned effectively for nearly three years until the male typographical union number six refused to work with employers who hired women. Instead, union men agreed to admit the women. Augusta Lewis accepted the deal, only to find that the men then steered work away from women who were simply left hanging.